Wow, so many exciting things happen around the church. We've got IF coming up. We've got Evolve, which is our student weekend coming up. So many exciting sermon series coming up. I just want to highlight one other thing real fast this morning. Not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, September. Oh, September, holy moly. <laughs> January 21st. Uh, September is my birthday, so hey, there you go. So January 21st. We start our Momentum series. Now, Momentum takes the place of our regular Wednesday night worship for just four weeks. Every Wednesday, we come in at 5.30. We eat a meal. It's catered. And then we move in here at 6, where we have a time of worship and a time of teaching. During this Momentum series, we're going to teach on your questions, the questions you want answered. I get questions from time to time on different things about church, about the Bible, about Christianity, uh, about Jesus, and we want to do everything we can to help answer those questions. And so we want your questions. You can put them on Facebook. You can tweet them. Just hashtag church questions so that we can get them. If you uh, want to send it to me by email or call the church office, you can do that. Or if you want to be completely anonymous in your question, you can do that too. Every morning when you come in, you get one of these. We call it our Life Together Guide. If you would just take the prayer request form that's on the bottom of it, as always, every Sunday you can turn a prayer request in by putting it on the prayer request sheet and putting it in the baskets at the back of the church. But I would say that if you have a question you want answered during the Momentum Series, if you'll put it on the prayer request side and put it in the baskets at the back of the church on your way out, then I'll get those and we'll be processing those as we start Momentum. Not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday. This morning, we're going to continue in our sermon series called Small Change, Big Difference. We launched this last Sunday, the first Sunday of 2015. We're talking about the small changes that none of us really want to make that really result in the big difference that all of us want. Things that we can do that are very small, they seem insignificant or even minute, but can make really, really big changes. Last week we talked about one word. And I would really encourage you, if you missed last week, uh, go to the website, you can catch it, or pull up our church app. If you don't have our church app, you can download it in the app store. It's just Aldersgate, plain Aldersgate. You can pull it up, and on either one of those places, you can watch mess the message from last Sunday. And I would really encourage you to do that and take this one-word challenge. I've got over 200 words sitting on my desk right now that you guys have sent me. You've been so good to go on Facebook and put them on there or tweet them to me or email them. Uh, you can do the same thing with your one word if you want to put it on the prayer request sheet and put it in the back of the baskets. You can do that. But I would really encourage you to take this challenge. I wanted to just share with you this morning, um, our students meet every Wednesday evening. And they have small group time together. There's a middle school group time and a high school group time. And uh, Michael shared with me this week some of the words, the one words that your high school students came up with this week in small groups. And I just want to share this list of words that they put on the table at their small group time. Prayer, surrender, think, patience, motivation, calm, grow, Courage, repent, obey, influence, trust, confidence, achieve, aftermath, persevere, leadership, diligence, and uplifting. Aren't those awesome? And I would get kudos to the students for sharing these and for letting me share them on Sunday morning. And as part of my word, which is power, I'm going to be praying for each of the students. And for each one of you who gives me your one word, I'm going to be praying for you this entire year because that's what God's told me to do as part of my one word. And so I would really encourage you to do that. Just one word, a small thing can make a huge difference. We're going to continue with that line of thinking today actually by talking about one thought. Next Sunday, we're going to talk about one habit, and the Sunday after that, we're going to talk about one relationship. But this morning, we're going to focus in on one thought, a small thing that can make a really huge difference. And so here's what we need to do to get us started down the line of one thought. I need to know what your thoughts are. Now, I really don't want to know what your thoughts are because that might scare me, especially right now. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a pop quiz. So I need to get out a piece of paper and a pen. Like, I'm not joking. I need you to get out a piece of paper and a pen. You'll find some pens in the seats there in front of you. Uh, you can use your life together guide. You can write on your neighbor's shirt. Something that you can write on, all right? We're going to take a pop quiz, a piece of paper and a pen. I'm going to ask you three questions so that you can find out where your thoughts are currently. These really aren't questions at all. 
what I'm going to give you is I'm going to give you two words that are paired. One word will be on this end of the spectrum, and one word will be on this end of the spectrum, and you're going to rate yourself from one to ten on that spectrum. So at the end of the pop quiz, you should have three numbers on your sheet of paper because I'm going to give you three sets of words. Okay, you ready? Here's set number one. Don't worry, I'll continue to explain it if you missed it. The first word on this end of the spectrum is worry. The word on this end of the spectrum is peace. And here's what I want you to do. On a scale of 1 to 10, I want you to rate yourself with your thoughts. So a 1 would be you're a worry wart and you are constantly worried about everything. You worry about money. You worry about people. You worry about your marriage. You worry about your kids. You worry about your job. You worry about uh, your church. You worry about where this message is going. You worry about everything. All right? That's a 1. A 10 would be you are a complete peace with everything in your life and the world. You have no anxiety, no stress, no worries of any kind, but you're at complete peace. So one to ten on that scale. Question number two, or word set number two. On this end of the scale, we have the word negative. On this end of the scale, we have the word positive. So a one would be you are a completely negative person. You see the worst in everybody. You see the, no, no elbows, please. You see the worst in every situation. You are highly critical of all people in your life, all events in your life, everything that's going on around your life. A 10 would be Mother Teresa. You are so positive about everything. You see the best in every person. You see the best in every situation. Even if it's cruddy, you want to see the best come out of every possible circumstance and situation. Okay? Word set number three. On this end of the spectrum, we have the word worldly. And on this end of the spectrum, we have the word eternity. And so if you're one... Everything in your life is focused on your stuff, your material possessions, what's happening in the here and now, what you're going to be doing this afternoon, uh, because if you're not coming to the leadership meeting, you're probably going to be watching the Cowboys this afternoon. You're all, everything's worried on that, all right? If you're on the eternity end, if you're a 10, everything is focused on the end, the very end, eternal life. Everything has to do with what's going to happen after you leave this earth. Everything is about eternity, Okay? So now here's what I want you to do. You have three numbers on your sheet of paper there. I want you to add those numbers up to get a total. It should be pretty easy for most of you. One plus one plus one is three, okay? <laughs> now, if you scored anything less than 30, this message is for you. If you scored a 30... Next week's message is for you. And the title of next week's message is Liar, Liar, Pants on Fire. <laughs> Take your Bible, open up to the Old Testament book of Lamentations. If you don't have a Bible, you'll find one there in the seats in front of you. You can pull it up on your phone or your tablet or whatever. Uh, Lamentations, just go to the table of contents and find a book in the Old Testament that starts with L-A-M. Lamentations. It'll be sandwiched between the Old Testament prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel. So while you're trying to pull up Lamentations either in your Bible... By the way, if you're using the Bible there in the seat in front of you, it's going to be on page 626. If you're using a Bible that looks just like this one, you're going to be on page 732. While you're trying to find Lamentations, either in your Bible or on your phone or whatever, let me tell you, it's sandwiched between Zeremiah uh, and Ezekiel. In the Old Testament, there are some books towards the end of the Old Testament, a whole bunch of them, called the Prophets. Prophets were God's chosen people. God chose to speak directly to them, and then they gave the message to God's people. And a lot of the messages that God chose to speak to them and that they gave to God's people is recorded in the Bible in the Old Testament in these books called Prophets. The Old Testament is divided into major prophets and minor prophets. Major prophets are the really important one. Minor ones you shouldn't even read, okay? No. Just making sure you're paying attention. That's not how it's divided. Listen, here's really how it got divided. 
Major prophets, this is just shocking. Major prophets are the long books in the Bible. Minor prophets are the short books in the Bible. Seriously, I'm serious. And sandwiched in between some of the major prophets, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel's in there. Between Jeremiah and Ezekiel, there's a book called Lamentations. It's actually a pretty short book, but it's considered grouped in with the major prophets. And the reason why is because we're not sure who wrote the book of Lamentations, but we're pretty sure it was the prophet Jeremiah. And it falls in right after the book of Jeremiah. Now, at the end of Jeremiah, which would have been about 586 B.C., Jerusalem has been completely destroyed. God's people have been conquered. The temple and everything else in Jerusalem has been completely destroyed. Now, this was a huge deal because Jerusalem was the capital city. It was the hub of all religious activity. Everyone came to Jerusalem for the religious festivals that were so key and so important in their culture. I mean, for the temple and for Jerusalem to be destroyed is a huge deal. So at the end of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is literally crying. In fact, Jeremiah is nicknamed the weeping prophet because all through the story of Jeremiah, God's been giving him warnings to give to his people. Listen, if you don't change your ways, if you don't do this, if you don't go back this way, then Jerusalem will be destroyed. And at the end of Jeremiah, that comes to fruition. And so Jeremiah is literally weeping. The very next book that follows Jeremiah is the book of Lamentations. And through the entire book of Lamentations, Jeremiah weeps. I mean, he, he, he's sad, he's grieving, and, and he lets it all out to God. In fact, the word for Lamentations in Hebrew, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, is the word Icha. Icha. It literally means how. Or, or, or really it means how did this come to be? Or how did this happen? And all through the book of Lamentations, Jeremiah, if he indeed wrote it, is saying, God, how did this come to happen? How did we get to this place? In fact, if you've got Lamentations open in chapter 1, we're going to be in chapter 3 here in just a second. But in chapter 1, it starts out in verse 1 saying this, How, how, how lonely sits the city that was full of people, talking about Jerusalem. How did this come to be? How did this happen? And all through the book of Lamentations, you can read it, it's a pretty short book. All through the book of Lamentations, Jeremiah is saying, how? How did this come to happen? I'm so sad about this. I'm so discouraged about this. I'm so disappointed about this. And he even goes on rants in the book of Lamentations. I mean, it's just this book of sad, depressing news filled with rants. It's like our modern day Facebook. Indeed. And it's just, I mean, listen, look at some of the stuff. Uh, turn over to chapter 3, okay? Uh, verse 16 in chapter 3. It says this. If you're in your phone, you can, you can get there. He has made my teeth grind on gravel. Isn't that something like someone, you're one of your friends would post, post on Facebook, right? He's made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft. That means absent. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. If it's not Facebook, it's the news. You ever turn on the news or read it, either in the antique newspaper or on your iPad or whatever? This is what it reads. It's bereft of peace. It makes us forget that we were ever happy in the first place. So I say, this is what Jeremiah says, my endurance has perished, so has my hope from the Lord. Listen, I want you to keep reading with me. Verse 19 of Jeremiah chapter 3. Uh, Lamentations chapter 3, verse 19. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Now, I don't know how that reads in your translations. Most of your translations say yet or but I call to mind. Whatever it reads in your translation, you need to underline it, you need to circle it, you need to highlight it, whatever, and we're going to come back to it, all right? Verse 22. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. 
I want you to see what's happening here as Jeremiah writes these words in Lamentations. He is totally focused in verse 19. He says, remember my affliction. Remember my grief. Remember my groanings. Remember, remember all this. Remember my wanderings. Remember the wormwood. Wormwood uh, was a drink in the culture. It came from a plant. And this plant was very, very bitter. And wormwood is a, is a word that, that is used to describe bitterness or, or harshness or, or anger or, or rage or resentment. And he's saying, remember my bitterness, remember my resentment and, and the gall. My soul continually, always, that's all I can think about, that's all I can hear about, that's all I can talk about is all of this affliction and all of my groanings and all of my depression and all of the sadness and all of what God didn't do for us. That's all I can remember. That's all I can talk about. That's all I can think about, verse 21. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have Do you see what just happened there? He totally changed his thought. All his thoughts were on was his affliction and his groaning and his depression and everything that was happening in his life and everything that wasn't good. All of his worry, all of his worldliness, all of his negativity. That's where everything was focused. And all of a sudden, he made one small change. He changed his thought. And you know what happened? Then he was focused on God's faithfulness and God's mercies that are new every morning and the hope that only comes from God. He he made a very small change. The scripture is very small. It uses one word, but or yet. But I changed my mind. Yet I changed the way I think. You see, small change, huge difference. We went from affliction and bitterness and resentment to faithfulness and new mercies and hope. Small change, big difference. That's the message today, is to make that small change in the way we think that results in a huge difference. Listen, the New Testament talks about it. Paul talks about it in several different places in the New Testament. I'm going to give you some scriptures. You don't have to turn there. In fact, they're going to pop up here on the screens behind me. You may want to jot them down on the same piece of paper you took your pop quiz on so that you can go back and study them this week. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Paul says this. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Instead, be transformed. Watch this. By the renewal of of your mind by changing the way you think don't copy the customs and behaviors of this world what's the customs and behaviors of this world negativity worldliness worry anxiety stress paul says don't copy those things instead change who you are and the customs that you copy and the way you change it is by changing the way you think But I call to mind. Yet I call to mind. Yet I'm going to change the way I think. Yet I'm going to move from here to here. It's a small change, but it makes a huge difference. Paul said it this way in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24. He's talking about taking off your old self. He says when we're in Christ, we take off everything that was old and we put on all the new that Christ brings to us. He says, put off your old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Change the way you think and put on the new self. So this morning, I'm going to give you two things, all right? Just two things. Write these down on the same piece of paper you took your pop quiz on. And what you want to do next week is make sure your number is higher. Two things that can help you change the way you think, that can help you move from here to here. It's going to be a very small difference, but it'll make a huge change in your life. I promise you this. Two things. Number one, capture the destructive thoughts. Capture the destructive thoughts. Thoughts are like hamsters running on a hamster wheel. You know what I'm talking about? 
Any of you have hamsters or have had hamsters before in the past? I grew up on a ranch. We had horses and cattle, and I don't know why in the house we had rodents. But anyway, we kept hamsters in the house. And I would see these hamsters or gerbils do this, and inside the hamster cage they have this little exercise wheel. And those hamsters get on that wheel, and, man, they go crazy. That wheel starts spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning. Here's what I'm telling you this morning. Kill the hamster. Now, if you have small children with you, I just offended you. Or if you give donations to PETA, I just offended you. Uh, Let's see. Relocate the hamster. Here's what Paul says. Write this down. It's going to be up on the screen behind me. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. It says, for though we walk in the flesh. Here's what he's saying. For though we're human, we're on this earth. We walk in the flesh We are not waging war according to the flesh. You ever feel like the thoughts happening in your mind are a war? We are not waging war according to the flesh. For weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion. You know what he's talking about? The hamsters, okay? We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion being raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. That small change in your life that will result in a huge difference starts by capturing the destructive thoughts. To take every thought captive. Listen, you are in charge of of what you think about. You control what you think about. You control what hamsters get on the wheel. Don't kill the hamster. Just relocate it and put a new hamster on the wheel. You you control what hamster runs. You control what you think about. And only you control what you think about. Now, I know what some of you are sitting there thinking. You're going, yeah, I know, but every once in a while, those little thoughts just pop into my mind. They come out of nowhere. I'm trying to control what I think about, and they just come out of nowhere, and they're crazy, and they, they tell me to do crazy things, and they're just there. What do I do with those? Listen, all of us have crazy thoughts from time to time. We all have those hamsters that jump on the wheel and just start running as fast as they can every once in a while. To me, it happens mainly at night when I can't sleep. I, we, Amy and I, my wife and I were talking about this yesterday. We had a breakfast date, and we were talking about this, our thoughts. And, and I was sharing some of the message with her, and I was telling her, I said, you know, when I get to this point in the message, I, I want to share a story about crazy thoughts that come into your mind, and you can't get rid of them, and you don't know why they pop up, and you don't know. And I said, I just can't come up with the right st- I mean, I, trust me, I have a lot of crazy thoughts, but I just couldn't come up with the right story. And, why, and Amy's sitting there going, ah, pick me, pick me, I'll help you. Our marriage thrives on sarcasm. And so she said, you remember when we were first married and we went to see that movie that time? I've heard this story several times. Here's what you need to know about me. I'm a very structured person. I thrive on routine. I love things to be scheduled and planned out. And so when those things don't happen in my life, uh, I consider that crazy. My wife, on the other hand, um, she, 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 she's not a planner and um, is not as structured and as routine as I am. So here's the point I'm trying to make. My crazy and her crazy are two different kinds of crazy. You got me? And so we had been married. I don't know how long we had been married. Amy would really tell this story better than I can. And we were both in college, and we didn't hardly have any money at all. I mean, that's just what our lives thought. We loved each other, but, you know, uh, anyway. We decided this one time, we don't even remember what the movie was, but we wanted to go see this movie so desperately. We wanted to go, and that was a real treat for us. We didn't just get to go see movies all the time because, man, movies are expensive. And so, anyway, we just didn't have the money to do this. So this was a real treat for us. We went to see this movie. We don't even remember what movie it was. We even treated ourselves, if we remember correctly, to a Coke and a popcorn at the movie theater. And, and that was a big deal because we have to have two Cokes because, uh, because of my structure and routine, I can't drink after anybody else. And so anyway, that's a whole different story. <laughs> even my wife, that's a whole different story. But so we watched the movie. It's a great movie. At the end of the movie, I turned to Amy and I, one of those hamsters got on the wheel in my head. 
And I said to her, do you want to do something really crazy? Now, you got to remember, her crazy and my crazy are two different kinds of crazy, right? And so her eyes got big, and she was like, oh, my gosh, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? What is this going to look like? And I said, let's go see another movie. <laughs> and I didn't mean sneak in. I meant go outside, buy two more tickets, and come in and see another movie. That was crazy to me. We didn't get to do that kind of stuff. I think she said something like, uh, no, let's just go home. So <laughs> here's what I'm saying. Every once in a while, once those little hamsters, don't judge my hamsters, okay? But every once in a while, one of those hamsters jumps on the wheel in your head, doesn't it? And it gets crazy. And you start thinking to yourself, I, I can't do that. I can't, I can't do that. I, I'm not good enough to do that. I'm not smart enough to do that. I, I don't have enough resources to do that. I, I, I can't do that. And by the way, I've always been told my entire life I'd never amount to anything. I can't do that. No, I, I, yeah, oh my gosh, that crazy thought just popped in my head. Man, I know I really shouldn't, but man, this news is so good. And I know I haven't verified it, but man, it would just feel so good to tell somebody else about it. Man, I really want to take that step, but. Man, I'm just I'm scared. I can't do that. I'm too scared. I can't do that. And that, that hamster of fear starts running on its wheel up in your head. Or, or, or maybe you, every once in a while, just hear the words, <laughs> no, you, you can't because your past says that you're not good enough to do that. You should have too much guilt and shame to say that you want to live that way. You can't do that. You know what I'm talking about, right? Those thoughts just jump into your head and they begin to overwhelm you and overtake you and, and paralyze you. And before you know it, you're scoring yourself at a one on the worry scale or the negativity scale or the worldly possessions scale. God wants you to find in your life today, yet I will think another way. Yet I will change my mind. You see, because there's one way to get those crazy thoughts out of your head. Are you ready for this? You and you alone choose what you think about. And the only way to replace a thought in your head, no matter how crazy it is when it pops, the only way to replace one thought in your head, listen, are you ready for this? Is to put a more powerful thought in your head. Right? So let's do this. Uh, I'm going to put a thought in your head right now because I can do that. Uh, pink elephant. What's happening in your head right now? Some of you are going, I see a pink elephant. Some of you are going, ooh, and I'm really confused now because I see a pink Tony Romo. But whatever. <laughs> pink elephant. Pink elephant. See, now you just switch. See, pink elephant. Pink elephant. Pink elephant. That's in your mind. Now watch this. Purple donkey. What just happened? Some of you have no clue. <laughs> Some of you are going, wow, I see a purple donkey. Why? Because the purple donkey was a more powerful thought than the pink Elephant. Here's the second thing you need to get. Capture the destructive thoughts. Here's number two. Focus on the constructive thoughts. You choose what you think about. So focus on the constructive thoughts. Here's another way to say it. Think about spiritual things. Because anything spiritual is always more powerful than whatever crazy thoughts run into your head. Here, here's what I want to challenge you to do. Give me some scripture here. All right. In Philippians chapter 4, 8, Paul says this. Whatever is true, he's saying this, this is what we should think about. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. You see, here's what Paul's saying. When one of those crazy thoughts comes into your head, if you get worried about something, if you get anxious about something, if you're negative about something, if you want to focus on where you're at here in the world today and you can't see past yesterday, think on the things that are true and lovely and honorable and praiseworthy and full of excellence. You see, because a thought out of Scripture, I can promise you, is always more powerful than the thoughts that the crazy hamsters running through your head give you. Always focus on the constructive thoughts and focus on the spiritual things. Here's what I'm talking about. This is just an exercise for some of you, okay? I may not touch everybody in here. I know that, but let me just give you some examples. If you're one of those who deals with fear 
and that's one of the thoughts that runs through your head all the time is fear, then here's what I would challenge you to do. I would challenge you to dig through the Bible, Google it. You find a verse that speaks to you. And every time that little fear hamster starts to jump on the wheel in your head, you say, "Uh uh-uh. I'm going, to take the cap- I'm going to take captive the destructive thought, and I'm going to focus on a more powerful thought. I'm going to focus on the spiritual thing. And your verse may be 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, that says, For God did not give me a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power. You see, if the thing that runs through your head all the time is worry, then your verse may be Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 7, that says, Do not worry about anything. But in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's the more powerful thought. Depression, if you to that place. Psalm 42, 11, Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God and I will praise him Again, you see, when you start to have those depressed thoughts, you go to Psalm 42, 11, and that's the thought that you focus on. That's the more powerful thought. That's your purple donkey. That's your good hamster, you see? Dis- disappointment. How many times are you focused on things when people just tell you, or are you telling yourself because you're beating yourself up? I blew it. I blew it again. I messed up. I didn't do it right. Then you know what? You need Romans 8, 28. And we know that God works in all things for good, even when we blow it. If you feel stuck in life, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, whether it's stuck in your job, stuck in your marriage, stuck wherever, Philippians chapter 4, 13, you know it, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. If you feel overwhelmed with stress and with worry and anxiety and all the things that are happening in your life, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, um, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not grow faint. If you're struggling with your eyes wandering to places they shouldn't be wandering, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. Flee from sexual immorality. If you're struggling with your past and the things that haunt you from your past, Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. One thing I do, I forget what lies in the past, and I look forward to what lies ahead. If you're dealing with guilt and shame from your past or whatever reason, then Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. When I ask you to give me your one word, I ask you to put a verse with it, and so many of you sent your one word to me, and you sent your verse with it, and when I'm praying for your one word, I'm praying for your verse as well, and I would encourage you, as you make this small change of changing the way you think, just a really small thing to make a huge difference in your life, find these scripture verses that speak directly to the thoughts you're having, and capture the destructive thoughts, and focus on spiritual things, with the spiritual word that comes directly from the Bible. It's a small change. It'll make a huge difference. It may just be one verse or one bit of a verse. It's a very small thing. It'll make a huge difference. Let me close with this story. There was a story. It's told in the early 1900s of a seminary professor and his wife who were vacationing And they found themselves in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and they were eating in a restaurant in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. And as they were eating, they recognized that there was this somewhat older gentleman. He looked very distinguished and very scholarly. And he was moving around the restaurant, and he was going from table to table. And he would stop at the table, and he would shake hands, and you could tell there was conversation being exchanged. And every once in a while, this elder, distinguished-looking, scholarly gentleman would actually pull up a chair and sit at the table where the conversation was being held that he was having with the people at the table. The seminary professor, being on vacation, started thinking to myself, Oh, my gosh, I hope he doesn't make his way over to our table. I don't really want to talk to anybody right now. I'm on vacation. I'm just here to have a nice breakfast in solitude. But sure enough, the gentleman made his way over to where the seminary professor and his wife were seated and having breakfast. He asked him a little bit about it and said, where do you, you know, oh, we're vacationing. We're now in Gatlin. We live, where are you from? We're from Oklahoma. Oh, what do you do in Oklahoma? He said, I'm a seminary professor. So the older gentleman said, oh, so you teach preachers how to preach. The seminary professor said something like that. And with that, the older distinguished gentleman pulled up a chair and said, listen, I got a story that you need to tell these preachers. 
And he began to tell this story. He looked out the window of the restaurant in Tennessee. The Smoky Mountains are everywhere. He said, look at those mountains over there. He said, there was a little boy born at the foothills of those mountains to an unwed mother. And all of his life, it's been so difficult for that little boy because everywhere he goes and everything he does, the question always comes up, who is your daddy? If I, the little boy, he enrolls in school, they want to know who's his daddy. If he's got to fill out an emergency form, they want to know who is his father. If he's got any extracurricular activities going on, he's got to find a permission slip. Who's your father? Can we have your father? All through life, this distinguished gentleman is telling the seminary professor and his wife this. That this little boy struggled with that question. Who is your daddy? The little boy was a church goer. At age 12, the church where he attended got a new preacher. Now, it was the little boy's custom, the distinguished gentleman said, that on every Sunday at the end of the message, boy, he would skirt out of church because he knew sometimes he would get caught by people and the question would come up, who's your dad? Who's your daddy? How did you get here? Who are you with? Well, this preacher was new, and so he did things a little differently. And on his first Sunday, the little boy got surprised, and the preacher was done before he could skirt out of church. So he ended up getting mixed into the crowd and ended up having to go through the entire church line, shaking the preacher's hand on the way out. When the little boy came up to the preacher, the preacher said to him, Oh, okay, who are you with? Who's your daddy? The distinguished guy said, The place fell silent. Because everybody in church wanted to know the answer to that question. And the little boy just stood there. He didn't know what to say. And the preacher began to feel the tension in the room. He could tell that something was wrong with that question. And so he got a big smile on his face. And he said, wait, wait, wait. Don't answer that question. I know the answer. I can see the family Resemblance. Why, it's stunning. It's all over your face. You're a child of God. The little boy broke out into a big smile. He had never heard that before. But all of a sudden, for the first time in his life, he had an answer to the question, who's your daddy? The preacher went on to tell him, son, that's a mighty fine inheritance. You better go claim that inheritance. That little boy skipped out of church that day. And every time from that day forward... This is what the distinguished gentleman is telling the seminary professor and his wife. Every day from that time forward, when he was asked the question, who's your daddy? He said, I'm a child of God. The older, distinguished, scholarly gentleman who had been having this conversation with the seminary professor and his wife stood up from the table, began to walk away, turned back to the seminary professor and said, You know, if it hadn't been for the preacher and that word he spoke to me that day, I don't know where I would have ended up in life. With that, he walked off. The seminary professor and his wife were stunned, and they didn't know what to say or how to respond. And so they called the waitress over to them and said, Man, he just told us this incredible story. Do you know who that man is? And the waitress said, Yeah, everybody knows who he is. That's Ben Hooper. He's the governor of Tennessee. Because of one thought that changed his life forever. It was a very small thing that made a huge difference. How do you need to change the way you think? It's a small thing. It'll make a huge difference difference. God, we thank for how you're speaking to us this year in the small things. Our one word and then today, God, our one thought. And God, we know that we come into this place this morning from many different walks of life. Some of us come in struggling with worry and anxiety and depression. Some of us come in struggling with negativity. Some of us come in struggling because we're so focused on what's happening in the here and now. Some of us are struggling with grief. Some of us are struggling with our past. Some of us are struggling with special sins. Some of us are struggling with what tomorrow holds. And God, those hamsters are running around in our head like crazy. And feeding those destructive thoughts, and they keep speaking to us and speaking to us and speaking to us. And God, many of us in this room are overwhelmed. 
And so God, this morning we pray that you would break through just like you did to Jeremiah and Lamentations. And we would have that moment where we say, yet I will change my mind. But I will change the way I think. I will allow you to transform my mind. I will focus on the spiritual things and not on the destructive things. And that this would be a life-changing moment for us. God, we realize it's something so small, but it could result in a change so huge. And so God, we pray right now for the boldness and the courage and the power to change the way we think. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The band's going to play. They're going to sing a song straight from the pages of Lamentations chapter 3. God's love never ends. His mercies are new. His faithfulness is forever. And his hope always endures. And listen, I don't know where you sit this morning. I don't know the place you come in. But I know, listen, I know that not one of you scored a 30 on the pop quiz. And God wants to change the way you think. And I pray that you allow the Holy Spirit to move in and make that small change.